you know, it's funny. I can remember, I think, being with you and Mr. Lampert on that day in question when you announced that deal. Uh, there were some who say, you know what, it was inevitable that Sears would find itself in this place, regardless of what happened, given the vast changes that have taken place in the retail industry over the last 13 years. Do you agree? Well, I, I, I don't know that anything is necessarily inevitable, but I, I think that one of the principal reasons that I did, in fact, uh, sell the company was that I had doubts about Sears' ability to survive, stand along for the longer term. I mean, we had a storied history. We had some great assets. Uh, during the time that I was CEO, my management team did some fantastic things in terms of improving customer service, merchandise offering. We had a, the leading internet uh, presence within bricks and mortar retail at that point. But retail's a tough business. And in our case, uh, our mix of goods was unique on the mall with 70% of our business competing with off-mall retailers like Walmart and Home Depot and Lowe's and, and our, basically our trade areas were shrinking as people grew off-mall and a principal driver of the Kmart opportunity from my standpoint was the, the, the potential ability to basically allow Sears to get off-mall and off-mall faster than it otherwise could by converting Kmart locations. Right. Um, and the deal, if people don't recall, I think was 55% stock, 45% cash. So you did give that opportunity to Sears holders to also participate in the combination. And by the way, people may forget, but Sears stock soared afterwards, in part on the in value that people perceived of the real estate. That ended up being ephemeral. Um, give me your take on sort of how that story went and why it was not realized in terms of somehow Mr. Lampert making a fortune out of the real estate itself. Yes, I think there, there was a lot of sort of mischaracterization at that point. Um, you know, Eddie Lampert, when he bought Kmart, I think very much was looking at Kmart as a real estate play. Uh, the Sears combination was never that. I think that Eddie very much viewed the uh, combination as the potential for him to have an operating success longer term. Uh, he, uh, as you may recall, would uh, talk quite uh, directly about the way that he thought a retail business that should be run should be run, and how that was different than conventional wisdom. And uh, shortly after the, the combination of the two companies, he proceeded to buy back you know, $5 billion worth of stock at well north of $100 a share. So I think that, that Eddie you know, very much was looking to have an operating success and to have an operating success principally under the Sears brand name. And obviously that didn't take place. Yeah, chose not to uh, invest in the stores, of course, is one of the key criticisms. Um, and to your point, spent an awful lot of money right. buying back stock at very high levels. Let's assume he didn't, though, and, and right. decided to put that $5 billion back into investing. Do you think it would be a different story we'd be viewing right now? Well, I think that you know, $5 billion still in the company coffers probably would have given Sears some more options than it's had the last several years. Uh, I, I do think that it's a hard job. I mean, I think that... Uh, me and my team, my predecessor and his team, you know, the predecessors before that, I mean, the Sears retail business has been, um, ha had, had been a challenge for a long time, and then you combine it with Kmart, who's competing versus Walmart and Target. I think Eddie Lampert signed up for a, a, a very significant operating challenge. And so, uh, you know, there were some ways, I think, that from a Sears Roebuck standpoint, that the Kmart transaction you know, gave the brand and the, and the business a chance to survive and thrive that it didn't have on its own. But it's a tough world. I mean, in 2005, when we put the two businesses together, we were a little over $50 billion in revenue. And, and Amazon, at that point in time, was $8 billion in revenue. So Amazon today is $225 billion in revenue. And Sears Holdings isn't $50 billion anymore. It's maybe, at best, you know, six, 6 or $8 billion after it emerges from the bankruptcy process. So there's been a, a tectonic shift in the retail landscape on that factor alone, even excluding the the more direct competition by Walmart, Home Depot, and, uh, and Lowe's and Target over this period of time. Alan, I know it doesn't do any good to do a forensic a reconstruction of uh, the business path, but when it came to asset sales, Craftsman, uh, Kenmore, Land's End, I wonder, was that really uh, burning the furniture to keep warm? Well, I think that, um, I mean, I, I've, you know, I've had a, a couple of pat lines, I think, since the transaction was done. I mean, in the early days, I basically said if I had complete confidence in the company's business, I wouldn't have sold it. And then I would say after the Great Recession, you know, that shifted to I know how this movie ends, I'm just not sure how many minutes are left. And I, I do think that the Great Recession was really the nail in the coffin for this, for this opportunity. And that's obviously largely unrelated to 
Eddie's management style or, or anything. I think that was just a, a hugely impactful negative event, particularly for the Sears franchise, which is much more correlated to housing turnover than, than anything huh. else in, in the economy. And so I think that you know, the, the fact that he began with a couple of spinoffs with the hometown stores, the Land's End business, and the uh, Seritage real estate play, I, I, that's not surprising. And then I think after that, you know, basically everything that he sold, the proceeds of that has stayed within the organization to, to I think, keep the lights on longer. And, and, and hopefully, I think, you know, for him to find a way to have a path to have an operating success despite yeah. the challenges. I wonder, it's interesting that you tie it to the, the financial crisis, because I've also heard others argue mostly economists argue that it was the period of abnormally low interest rates that kept Sears basically alive for the past nine years. Is that fair? No, I, I, I don't think I would go there. I think that, uh, I mean, it, and to Eddie's credit, he never put a lot of, of debt on this business. So he, for a financial guy, he ran a relatively unlevered investment here for a long time, absent the $5 billion that went to buy back stock. And so I think that um, there really wasn't an interest rate correlation. But in my Sears time, I mean, there was no question that housing turnover was the big driver. And housing turnover, either new construction or resales, you know, got killed in that Great Recession period. And when somebody moves to a new house, you know, whether it's a brand new construction or a, an existing home, they want the, the, the latest flat screen TV on the wall and they don't want to move the dirty, filthy old lawnmower. And, and the refrigerator is old and they want a new refrigerator. So the Sears franchise really kicks in with mattresses and everything else in conjunction with a real estate transaction. And that just never came back to the level that it had been before. Uh, we've had uh, one guest in particular uh, say that you share some of the blame here, that, uh, that you know, Sears' decline began under you, uh, and obviously the sale itself was just a, a recognition of some of the missteps that took place. Well, I, I obviously I disagree with that, and I guess I would, would cite a few things. I mean, we, we, uh, we clearly left a few things yet to be done at the time that we sold the business, but we improved customer satisfaction, we reduced cost, we improved our merchandise offering, notably with the Land's End acquisition and being part of that. We had a very successful sale of our credit business. We had the leading online uh, bricks and clicks e-commerce presence of established retail at that point in time. And, and I guess you know, we also had, it in, in that period, record retail profitability. I mean, the retail business had never made more money than it did under my leadership. And I guess just a, a sort of another fact I would cite is that, as you well know, I think Fortune does its most admired company list. And in the survey that took place before I became CEO, we ranked 10th in our sector. And in the last survey that was done when I was CEO, we ranked third. And so despite all the noise in the last you know, X, X number of years since the Sears Holdings was created, you know, our team accomplished a lot, and I'm very proud of what our team did. We worked very hard to, to provide better customer service and make the business better, and our shareholders did well. Yeah, uh, and they did, uh, as I pointed out earlier, and had an opportunity to sell out of the uh, combined company at, a, at an even higher premium. Um, what do you think happens now if uh, Lampert's successful and sort of coming out of bankruptcy with 400 stores? Can Sears survive? I mean, those numbers you gave from Amazon are, are you know, we know them, but they're astonishing when you hear them, and you just wonder, what is the point right. of even trying to make a go of it? Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, I'm hopeful that, that there is, in fact, some operating success that comes out of this, and I, I'm sure that Eddie is also. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I think, you know, obviously many people have said it, it's doubtful and unlikely that a retailer that goes into a Chapter 11 process, you know, comes out of it and stays out of it. I mean, I, th I think it's rare that that's happened in retail bankruptcy history. Uh, it's possible, in my view, that, it, that he winds up with a going concern that's basically based online and that, in fact, the store base may you know, shrink further after they hopefully co do come out of Chapter 11. But there is an ongoing you know, Sears presence online. That area seems to be one area that Eddie's paid a lot of attention to, invested behind, seems to have a lot of interest in. That's been a common theme of his for a number of years. And the stores that are left probably do have some retail value, although obviously there's more retail stores available these days than there are tenants yes. to occupy them. Yeah. Well, on that point, let me end just getting your opinion on another storied name that a lot of people believe may have to pass uh, into history as well, which is J.C. Penney. Faces many of the same pressures, doesn't it? Uh, it does. Uh, I, I guess just as a, as a frame of reference, in 2008, just about the time of the recession, you know, Penney's was $20 billion in revenue. It's now 12. And so it's had a huge drop in revenue. It, it's, it's hard to say. Actually, it'd be an interesting debate as to whether 
you know, Penny's has done better because you know, Sears has declined or, or Sears has done better because of Penny's decline. But you know, you've got two retailers that are both a couple hundred yards from each other in the typical shopping center. But I, I do think that we're at a bit of an inflection point now. And if the economy ticks down a bit, that those retailers that have low returns, and Penny's being a principal one of those, uh, have a very, very difficult challenge of surviving.